Next, what else? Is there going to be another West Bruce Jr. Lang tour? Jack Bruce died, man. Did you know that? Did you know that Jack Bruce died? It's a shame. It's a very uh, <clears throat> sore spot. I had a picture of Jack, I think, the day before he died. And uh, it's very sad. But on a new album, uh, I recorded a version of Spoonful. And I think it was in Poughkeepsie, New York. And Jack was recording with me in the studio, and I guess the promoter heard that. Wow, Jack Bruce is in town. Leslie, we think they do an improv set tomorrow night. It was a Friday night. We want to know about Saturday night. So Jack said, yeah, he'd love to. So we went and recorded. My engineer, Paul Rafino, had the bright idea to record it on a stereo deck. And so uh, my producer and myself, my engineer, Mike Goldberg, uh, we edited, oh, that's him. <laughs> So we edited it down to seven minutes and something, so I have a tribute to Jack on there with Spoonful, and when I listened to it, I get tears in my eyes because the guy knew what I was gonna do before I was gonna do it, musically. And sometimes I knew what he was gonna do before, but uh, it's a really great uh, track and tribute to him on the uh, sound check. I don't think you realize when you play that harmonic, yeah, I do realize that. Uh, <laughs> you know what else I realize? Yeah. When you hit that harmonic, the imaginary question. See from imaginary western, you hit that harmonic. That's what you played, the right answer. <laughs> Who's got a question? Yeah. Good. Um, when you decided to keep going with Mountain after Felix was killed, did you get a lot of flack for doing it? Well, Felix quit the group long before that. Right. So the only flack was uh, his wife shot him with a gun. So you don't want to give your wife a gun. <laughs> right? Mike, is the game all the way up on there? Yeah, yeah. Give me some No, uh, it was very difficult to play with Felix at that time. His wife got really involved with him to the point where it was negative rather than positive. I heard that I think even though we lost a lot of great musicians in the last year, Johnny Winter, Jack Bruce, yeah, yeah. Joe Cocker, but Felix's wife, they found dead in Mexico, so that was a, not a great loss at all. Yeah. I was thrilled. <laughs> you know, nobody knew who the fuck she was. She was there looking probably for drugs in Mexico. And um, yeah, a lot of great people uh, died this year. In fact, on the new album, Soundcheck, 
my wife Jenny wrote a great poem to honor Johnny Winter. Because I had just, I played on Johnny's last album, there was a track on there, Long Tall Sally, I did. And on my last album, Johnny uh, did a song with me, I think, uh, what is it, Mike, Dead? Busted the Discussion of the Dead. And so, Johnny liked the way it sounded so much, I turned him on to uh, Metal Mike, and Mike mixed uh, Johnny's album, he got a Grammy for it, so. Wow. That was very good for him. I got shit, but he got a Grammy. Thanks to you, Big Daddy. <laughs> Go ahead. We're having fun now. Go ahead. You use the front pickup much now that you have a guitar that has them on it? Say it again? Using, are you using the front pickup much now that you have a guitar that has two pickups? Well, you, well yeah, I use the one pickup guitar. This one I just used tonight to, uh, you know, fool around. sampled, uh, well thank you very much. Yeah, Jay-Z used it to uh, write 99 Problems, and he used Billy Squire's song, The Big Beat, and he combined the two of them. Now when I wrote the song in 69, believe me, there was no hip-hop. So, Jay-Z was first to sample it, and then Kanye West sampled and used the two songs. And what they sampled was, we recorded live at the Fillmore, and you could hear me in the beginning of the song, Long Red, louder, louder. <laughs> so 400 and some odd different records have sampled that. If you go to uh, whosampled.com, and they'll tell you what minute and what second and what song they, they uh, use my, on my samples, which is pretty amazing, because it was a long time ago, and uh, not just rap guys, but Lana Del Rey sampled it on a song called uh, Born to Die or something, and it sold three million on my copies. Except that they never paid me, so she's gonna get sued. <laughs> just letting you know, you know it's not the, the, her, her producer said that, well, he didn't use my voice, he just did it to sound like me. But I don't know if he can sound like me. Louder! 
Anyway, it's uh, so you never know what when you write a song, what's going to happen years later, man. 1969 to now, Billy Squire actually, he's got more samples than anybody. So between me and him, two white guys, and uh, it's a lot of fun, man. Looking at my wall, I see platinum albums for Kanye West, Common, <laughs> Jay Z, and uh, yeah. Right song. You all play guitar? Anybody play guitar out there? No? Drummer. Not one, one, two guitar players in the whole lot? Three? This much. I play like that much. You? <laughs> you? Surprise, surprise. No, really, what's your real profession? Are you a dental? Uh, dentist? Warehouse owner, really. Oh. Hey, yeah, so if you play guitar, write some songs. It's a great uh, equalizer, I think. I play a little bit of a song from uh, the new album. It's called "People Get Ready" by um, Curtis Mayfield and. Uh, try to do it, I jumped back to the great job with Rod Stewart and I didn't want to copy any of what they were doing, so I tried to do it in my own uh, way. I dedicated it to uh, a guy named Bobby Pace, you might see his name in the album. And he was my first group road manager, the Vagrants was my first group. I've been lucky, I've only been in three groups, Mountain, West Bruce and Lang and that. The only thing is we couldn't get a hit record. We tried, man. We really tried. So along comes this guy, Felix Pavilardi, and uh, Atlantic Records sent him over. And he comes in when he's got this bandana around his neck, mustache, he like uh, Speedy Gonzalez or something. And uh, I, uh, he was going to produce us. So he did produce two singles, and nothing happened with them. And then two years later, I'm picking up an album, I see... This was Disraeli Gears by Cream, produced by Felix Babalardi. So I said to my brother, Larry, who's the bass player in the Vagrants, I said, how come we don't sound like Cream? He says, we suck, we, you, we don't practice enough. 
why don't you go practice? So I started to practice, and I went to the Village Theater, which became the Fillmore East, and my brother says, let's go to see Cream, but let's take some acid. Oh my God, when the curtain opened and I heard them play, it was like, I wanted to quit. So I started, you know, really buckling down, rehearsing more than 10 minutes a day. I started, oh, maybe 20 minutes a day. <laughs> no, but that was a, a game changer for me, but yeah, Fillmore East and uh, Fillmore West was actually Mountain's first gig. And it was headlined by Jack Bruce and Friends and Johnny Winter and then on the bottom mountain and I was scared to death. But that was the beginning of it. I met Jack Bruce then and uh, he had left Cream and he put this group together and um, I think John McLaughlin was the guitar player. You heard of John McLaughlin when you guys? Yeah. So Jack says to me, Liz, can you go show John what kind of amp you're using? He seems to only get this clean, jazzy sound. I'm looking for something with more bowls, like yours. I said, you want me to go tell John McLaughlin what to use? What he said, yeah, he's, what he, I told him you, you were gonna help him. I said, Jesus Christ, okay. <laughs> I said, oh yeah, sure, no problem. I didn't know what I was doing. But I did tell him to, you know, try this amp and try getting this kind of tone, incredible guitar player, but uh, you know, you want all the uh, balls in your... Uh... Thank you. 
what that's from? What is it? Close Encounters. Yeah, when the mothership came over and uh, landed in your... <laughs> piece called Peter and the Wolf. But it's not, it's, it's called The Hole of the Mountain King. And, uh, it's the only play, classical song I know. The biggest influence was probably <coughs> Keith Richards, Eric Clapton, Jimi Hendrix, Jimmy Page. Yeah. Uh, now, where's your favorite place to play? Colton. Vintage Bino! <laughs> yeah. My favorite place to play in New York? Or anywhere. We played, uh, I have to say this, Medworth in London is the big uh, festival they have every year. It's like 100, 200,000 people. And then Nuremberg we played where, I don't know if you ever saw the, the big wall where Hitler stood up there and he had a big audience. That was what is now a concert uh, feel, but it's right in back of U.S. Air Force. We have barracks over in Germany. And seeing all those soldiers that came to see us play at the, the open air festivals. And uh, there's quite a few of them. Each country sort of had one. Nebworth was England, and uh, in France there's one too. But I think Nebworth and uh, the German uh, open air festival. It's great. Yeah, New York was Carnegie Hall. Mountain got to play, uh, well, not really Mountain, it was West Bruce and Lang. What about Atlanta Pop? Yeah, that was something else. Leslie. The Atlanta Pop, the Atlanta Pop Festival is a show on Showtime now, a biop called Jimi Hendrix, The Electric Church. Yeah. And it's about the Atlanta Pop Festival. I became friendly with his sister Janie and, um, she did a, uh, this, you know, bio documentary on 
what it was like to play there. They had actually, I think, some better acts at the Atlanta Pop Theater at Woodstock, or more. And it was 120 degrees on the on the field that day. But she wanted to know what Jimmy sounded like, and uh, I said, there wasn't a time when Jimmy never sounded really good. But on that day, it was so hot, and it didn't bother him at all. And the crowd, I mean, really. But if you watch that documentary on Showtime, I think uh, you learn something from it. All right. Will we. Uh, Playing like a little more of an active role in the, that metal show, like you know, sort of like on the bench with them. I'm the announcer on that metal I, show. That's definitely, but I'd like to see you up there with the knowledge that you have. Yeah, but yeah, boys, yeah, boys, yeah, girls, it's time for that metal show. Yeah. Is that what you're talking about? Yeah. If you look on the thing, the first I call Howard Stern because they asked show. me to do it, and I wanted, I just didn't want to say hey, the metal show with Jim Florentine, Eddie Trunk. I wanted something a little funny. So Howard knew that I, the stutter voice, he says, why don't you start it by stuttering and then go into your announce. So at the end of the show, it says, announcer Leslie West, and then it says, announcer advisor, Howard Stern. <laughs> so uh, I own for that, but I, I think the show starts in March. I'm not sure, uh, I hope they have me back. Great interview on Stern. Okay. you did work yeah, I heard of an interview with this you did. Now, when you came on, you scared the bejesus out of a lot of people. They didn't work ready for you. Was that true? Wait, say that again? Which stuff? Yeah. It was like, I think it was 9 o'clock. You played like 11 set, uh, song set. I think we came on just as it started to get dark. And I heard that you scared the bejesus out of a lot of people when you played. Was that like that? And people weren't ready for you? I don't know what they were ready for, but uh, <laughs> yeah. the dead went on before us, and they asked for a... Uh, can you do me a favor? I'm trying to talk here. Mm -hmm. um, I lost my place. Oh yeah, the Grateful Dead came on before us. They wanted a do-over. They weren't happy with the way they sounded, but there was not enough time to I mean, obviously imagine, do. Imagine like they played and all of a sudden you just blew everybody away at night. I don't know if we blew everybody away, but... <clears throat> yes, you Creedence did. came on 10 years after. I think Janis Joplin, I'm, I'm not sure, but that was... That was the nicest night, weather-wise, and it was warm. Friday night, it rained, and they called it Mudstock. It's terrible. And the only reason we were on that show is we had the same agent as Jimmy. And Jimmy Hendrix's agent, Ron Terry, must have said, yeah, you can have Jimmy, but you have to take this unknown group, you know, and just starting out from New York. And I guess they force-fed us down uh, their throat, but... It worked out, even though we weren't in the movie, uh, Woodstock Tour, we right? in the 40th anniversary box set. Yeah. They found uh, our film and the uh, two of the songs in there on video. And it was mixed by Eddie Kramer, Jimmy's uh, producer, so. They may even have that box set here. Last time I had, do you, do you know if they have, you know which one I'm talking about? The box, we may Woodstock or may and not. the Suede. Yeah, I think, maybe not, but I'll check. Yeah, that would be great, man. All right, so what are we going to do here? We're going to put a table up there and we'll let you oh, know. Good.